Chapter 9, Topic 9.2, Methods of Physical Control. The topic objectives are name six methods of physical control of microorganisms, discuss both, mo both moist and dry heat methods, and identify multiple examples of both. Define thermal death time and thermal death point. Explain methods of moist heat control. Explain two methods of dry heat control. Identify advantages and disadvantages of, disadvantages of cold and desiccation. Differentiate between the two types of radiation control methods. Explain how filtration and osmotic pressure function as control methods. Now let's talk about the various categories of physical methods. First off, in general, physical methods are more likely to sterilize than chemical methods. Now some of these um, physical methods are not sterilizing methods and I'll point out to each one of them as we go through them whether it's a sterilizing method or a method that can be used to sterilize or whether it's more controlling microbial growth without killing them. But we're going to be talking about filtration, temperature under which category is moist heat, dry heat and cold, bet you didn't think about cold as being temperature, and desiccation, osmotic pressure, and radiation. Now the book covers more categories than that, but these are the categories that you need to be concerned about for this class. The first physical control method we're going to talk about is filtration. This is where you take a fluid or a gas, you run it past a membrane in which there are tiny little holes, we call this a filter, and you physically remove the microbes. It's kind of like what we were talking about in the last chapter, when we were talking about filtration to remove the microbes to grow them so we can determine growth. This way we're removing them because we don't want them in either the fluid or the gas. Now we talk about sterilizing fluids or gases with filtration but technically this isn't the case because viruses can f wiggle through those filters. They're very small. So even though we talk about sterilizing with filtration, we really don't, but it's close enough. Examples of filtration that you may already be familiar with are filtering water, such as if you go backpacking and you filter the water before you drink it, that's getting rid of Giardia that our friend the beaver here in the picture is putting into the water. You really don't want Giardia, causes backpacker diarrhea, lasts a long time. Another example of filtration that you may be familiar with is running air through a HEPA filter. HEPA filtration is the standard for sterilizing or disinfecting air in hospitals. We also have a HEPA filter in the lab and also they've been putting HEPA filters into homes and into vacuum cleaners to cut down on dust mites and all sorts of other nasties that we don't want to be breathing in. Moist heat can be a sterilization method. You're familiar with moist heat probably in the area of boiling water if there's a boil order on or um, in movies you know you boil the water to get the instruments in if you're going to be performing backroom surgery or helping with the birth of a baby. Boiling water actually does not sterilize. It does not kill endospores and it doesn't kill the endospores of botulism, therefore it is not considered a sterilization method. There are two definitions for sterilization. One is complete kill of anything, up to and including endospores. The other one is commercial sterilization, which is getting rid of botulism endospores. Generally speaking, if you eat botulism endospores, it's not going to be a problem. You're not going to get botulism from it. But if you're canning and you have botulism endospores, surviving, boiling, and they grow in your canned goods, then you can get botulism. So you're going, but wait a minute, I've canned before and that's getting rid of botulism endospores. Well, you're right. We're using pressure. Okay. If you add pressure, that ups the temperature Okay, because when you boil something, the water stays at a certain temperature at sea level, it's 100 degrees C, until the water completely evaporates and then the temperature of your pot will go up and you'll destroy your pot. But if you add pressure, you can up that temperature up to, um, in autoclaves, it's 120 degrees C. That's high enough 
Okay, you've got the pressure on it, you're keeping the steam in so that the water boils at a higher temperature. So that kills the endospores. This also happens when you're canning in your pressure cooker. Generally speaking, in labs and in hospitals and different places, including dental offices, you will use an autoclave where you have pressurized moist heat, and that's going to kill everything. Now, we also use moist heat in when we pasteurize milk. We're not aiming to sterilize milk when we pasteurize it. We just want to get rid of the microbes that are going to cause disease and lead to increased spoiling. Most of these organisms, with the exception of botulism and some of these others, um, are sensitive to heat. So you don't have to get it up to as high a pressure as you would in, a, in an autoclave or even boiling. But this gets rid of most of your microbes. The milk stays fresh for longer and you don't have to worry about botulism because we don't keep milk in airtight containers. I should explain here that the organism that causes botulism only grows in airless conditions and it uses endospores to survive situations in which there's air. So that's why I keep saying you don't have to worry about botulism in containers that are, have airflow. But pasteurization also gets rid of nasties like listeria that's been in the news with the cantaloupes, um, also E. coli and other things that are found in the guts of cows and not to be gross or anything but whatever comes out of the end of a cow is going to get on the udder. Now you're probably wondering why having heard this there's been a push lately toward uh, promoting the health benefits of drinking raw milk. Well when you pasteurize you do lose some of the nutritional value of milk because when you're denaturing through heat the proteins of the microbes, you're also denaturing some of the proteins and the enzyme in the cow's milk and it is less nutritious. And with modern dairy practices, um, the udder is cleaned very well and there's been a very low incidence of people becoming sick from drinking raw milk. There have been some and personally I'm a microbiologist and I just can't drink raw milk just can't do it. I also can't eat sushi. I've been told it's wonderful, it's tasty, very few people get sick from eating sushi, but I just can't do it. A moist heat sterilization is one of the most common forms of sterilization, especially in the lab or in the clinical environment, but there are times when you can't use it. When you have something that will be destroyed or damaged by moisture, Okay, think, uh, well, in the dental industry, generally, it's high carbon steel instruments. High carbon steel instruments are not stainless. They rust really well when they're exposed to liquids. You're probably going, why don't they use stainless steel instruments? Well, they don't maintain their edge very well. Also, if you're trying to sterilize a powder, you really don't want to add water to it. So moist heat is um, not always the best method to use. So you have to take into consideration with all these methods, which one's best for the application. On to dry heat. You've actually been using dry heat as a sterilization method in the lab. Can you think of what it is? That's right, flaming your inoculating loop. We refer to this as incineration. You've heated the wire to the point of where it glows and you just burn off those poor little microbial bodies. Now we can do this when we've got a nice thin wire or a thin surface. We also use incineration when we're trying to get rid of large amounts of protein. Um, if a cow is found to have mad cow disease, it's incinerated. So they take it to a pit. In this case, this is a probably a picture from when they were getting rid of herds that had hoof and mouth disease and they would slaughter the animals, put them in a big pit, completely incinerate them, and bury them up. By the way, if they're getting rid of a cow that has mad cow disease, um, they're not going to allow the smoke to drift off like this because the agent that causes mad cow disease can survive certain amounts of incineration, but we'll talk about that at the end of this chapter when we talk about how tough some microbes are. In modern society, we use cold all the time to control microbial growth. Cold does not kill microbes. Kills people, generally doesn't kill microbes. So you can put your milk in the refrigerator and it's good for a couple of weeks and then what happens? 
That's right. You're on your way to sour cream or yogurt. We generally go ooh when we toss it out. We can also freeze things, and that preserves things for even longer. Now let's talk about why cold does this. Cold is slowing down the, active, uh, the activity of molecules so that enzymes function slower and slower. The lipid membrane moves slower and slower. Transport in and out of the cell is slower and slower. And it basically puts the bacteria into a state of suspended animation. And if you freeze it, that further enhances it. Now, if you freeze things wrong, then you can kill a certain amount of microbes. Murphy's Law, it's generally a problem when you're trying to preserve the cultures, but if you put a steak that is highly contaminated into the freezer and freeze it for long periods of time, it is not going to reduce the numbers of microbes to acceptable levels. It's just not going to do it. Like I said, it's Murphy's Law. So cold is a control method, but it is not a sterilization method, but it's a very effective one. Desiccation is a fancy word for drying out or removing water. Here are some examples of some desiccated food items. As you probably will have guessed by now, desiccation is one of the oldest methods of controlling microbial growth in the preservation of food. We still use an awful lot of dried food items. Desiccation does kill microbes. As you remove the water, you're removing water from the cell, and most of them will die. So this is why dried substances will last for a long period of time. And it's only those that are sort of dry, like the raisins off to the side, that you will get organisms that are resistant to osmotic pressure, that are either hollow tolerant or tolerant of high concentrations of sugars, like what you have in your raisins, are going to be able to survive on it. So that's why things that are dried out have a tendency to go moldy. Fungi, yeast are osmotolerant. So that's using desiccation to preserve foods by decreasing the number of organisms that are in your food items and preventing um, other organisms from coming by and eating them before you get a chance to. Desiccation has varying results uh, depending upon the toughness of the organism. Gonorrhea uh, will resist drying for about one hour. So you're highly unlikely to get gonorrhea from toilet seats especially if you make sure they're dry. TB, on the other hand, they have a waxy coat. Remember that mycolic acid, the cell wall of acid fast bacteria? This prevents desiccation. So even when you're drying sputum that has come onto a table or something like that, you're not drying, it is just drying. Um, then the organism resists that drying process and can survive that for long periods of time. Also, to remind you about chapter 6, we use desiccation as a preservation method for pure cultures. Do you remember what that was? That's right, lyophilization. It's a fancy word for freeze drying. Osmotic pressure is related to desiccation. Osmotic pressure is where you're putting a higher sugar or salt concentration outside of the cell, drawing the water out of the cell and it results in most of them dying unless they're osmotolerant. Now, desiccation, we're removing water to achieve the osmotic pressure. Okay. Osmotic pressure, when we refer to that, that's usually where we're adding sugars or adding salts to something to increase the osmotic pressure. We're doing this without removing the water. Honey is a prime example. Um, this is where we add honey or sugars to substances to make them less pal palatable to the microbes. Um, for example, if you're trying to preserve your fruits from your garden this summer, what are you going to do? You're going to make jams out of them. Actually, you could make juices and just cap it and can it, but traditionally you didn't have that as an option. So what we did is we added a whole bunch of sugar and that increases the osmotic pressure and you end up with um, preserved fruits. Also hams. If you salt a ham, and hams are all salted, you're adding salt to it, increases the osmotic pressure, makes it so microbes don't 
live there and we preserve our foods. Now we've gotten away from doing an awful lot of this now that we have refrigeration. Uh, we don't like things as sweet. We don't like things as salty because we don't have to do that to preserve our food. We still like honey and we still like sweet things, but it's a uh, little less prevalent. Now to the last physical method, using radiation. Uh, you're probably going, ah, radiation! Radiation has gotten a bad rap <laughs> through uh, various uh, events in Japan recently and also from atomic bombs and what have you. Radiation has gotten a bad rap, but radiation is very useful in, in controlled ways to control microbial growth. So let's talk about light. Visible light is the spectrum of light, the wavelength of light that you can see, um, and it does not kill microbes. If we move to shorter wavelengths, more energetic wavelengths, then we start killing microbes. So let's talk about UV. UV radiation is non-ionizing. In other words, it's not removing an electron from an atom, so we're not creating ions. What we're doing is we're creating mutations or bumps in DNA by either denaturing it or by causing bonding between bases that shouldn't be. We'll be talking about this more in Chapter 8, but I want to introduce it here, and I do want you to know that UV radiation is non-ionizing. Now this is the wavelength that is bacteriocidal. We use this in microbial biosafety hoods. We put a UV light on it, kills just about everything. It is considered a sterilization method. The problem is, is it doesn't penetrate. You can use a piece of paper to block UV radiation. Makes you feel better about going into the sunlight, right? So yeah, if you wear clothes, you're less likely to get burned. Okay. Now if we move up from that, we're going to skip x-rays because they're not commonly used. If we go to gamma rays, you're probably familiar with gamma radiation coming from outer space and we use uh, telescopes that pick up gamma irradiation to see into distant galaxies. We can also use this to sterilize. Gamma rays are ionizing. Okay, The rays are energetic enough that they're going to knock electrons off of molecules and we're going to create ions where they shouldn't be. If you create ions in the plasma membrane, then your plasma membrane breaks down. If you create ions and proteins, you change the structure. If you create ions and DNA, you break up the DNA, you cause mutations. Okay, it's sterilizing. Gamma rays penetrate further than UV rays do. So in lab, when we've used those single wrapped um, pipettes that are in these the paper, it's paper on one side, plastic on the other, those have been sterilized by gamma radiation. The radiation goes through, kills the microbes, passes on through, it's no longer there. The item is not radioactive. It's only radioactive if you have an atom that's giving off radiation stuck on there. But when the radiation passes through, it sterilizes, generally does not distort the plastic, and we consider this a method of cold sterilization. We use this when we can't autoclave something and you can't boil it okay, because it's sensitive to heat or moisture and we can sterilize powders and all sorts of good stuff. Now in Europe they sterilize food by using ionized radiation, by using gamma rays. They wrap the item in plastic, they zap it with gamma rays and they can put milk and raw meat and all sorts of good stuff on the shelves and it does never rot. Now it may break down chemically and it may go rancid in other words, but it's not going to rot. It doesn't have microbes in there and you don't have to worry about E. coli or listeria or all sorts of other stuff. Alright, that's it for the first half of chapter 7. Stretch, take a break, think about something else, come back and we'll talk about con chemical control methods. Well, that's it for this topic. As a reminder of what the learning objectives for this topic were, you should be able to name six methods of physical control of microorganisms, discuss both moist and dry heat methods, and identify multiple examples of both, define thermal death time and thermal death point, explain methods of moist heat control, explain two methods of dry heat control, identify advantages and disadvantages of cold and desiccation, 
differentiate between the two types of radiation control methods, and explain how filtration and osmotic pressure function as control methods.